although I think also just urban planning generally. Uh, so today we have two folks, uh, somebody who works for, and I'll not introduce themselves, but we've got somebody who, um, who works for a local transit agency by day. He's here as a free man, a concerned citizen, and he's going to tell us about uh, something cool. And then our other friend is a columnist for a local uh, for a local publication, and he's also going to talk about transit because it's transit day. Um, cool. And before we do all that, let's do a round of really quick introductions. We say kind of your name, your affiliation, and your interest. So I'm Juan Velez. I'm with this group over the city. We organize a tech night, and we buy your pizza, so you should pay us back because <laughs> our kids want to go to college. And um, that's it. Uh, Joe Olson, I just work for various startups in the area. I'm Derek Eater. I also organize this event with Open City and DataMate, and I make civic apps with Open Data. Uh, I'm Plunter, and I'm a student at the University of Chicago. I'm Dr. Inquiry with the School of the Area Institute of Chicago. Josh Novotsky, I work um, at the EPA, and I'm a student at the University. Curtis Woodick, I work for the National Park Service, and my interest is in water. Uh, Reed Compton, I'm a freelance filmmaker in Rome. I'm Randy Baxley, and I'm a student of Python. I'm Larry Rosenbaum, and I'm a developer at Howard. Joe Gucci, I work at the CTA here representing myself. Uh, Michael Renahan, I'm the director of web and organizing for action for the new Obama issue group. And uh, I'm just here to, to meet developers who are interested in uh, certain issues and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Andy Creighton, I'm a developer also at Morgan Interaction. Uh, Tom Kambari, I team towards uh, and Byer Schlitz. Hi, I'm Alessandro, I'm a student at UAC. I'm interested in uh, machine learning, applying machine learning to uh, problems, social problems. Um, Richard Lee, the developer of Howard's. I'm Devin Blandon. Um, I'm new to the group. I'm from Washington, D.C., which I think instilled some kind of civic duty in me. Um, and I currently work as a Ruby um, backbone JavaScript developer. The name D.C. didn't turn you off of all things all together? No, no. And uh, my parents were not in politics. They were in the nonprofit sector, so I think that's even more of a reason why I don't like civic duty. <laughs> Well, my name is Stephen James. I'm a transportation reporter for a blog called Streets Blog Chicago. Paul Baker, Open Data Institute. The current site is schooltext.org, which is very active. Uh, one of the founders of Open City, founder of WebText. Also worked on the Obama 2008 uh, stuff and worked with Fireworks. Uh, got some good projects. I'm Ed Zadi. I gave Paul his first job in Chicago 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, I do. I'm a, do. I'm a writer, journalist. Do a lot of work with the Reader, and I'm also a transit consultant. And I do, have done the work, city planning work for the city of Chicago. Christopher Whitaker, big fan. Swing back around. I'm Chris Fernani. I worked at a startup here at 1871. We do analytics, GIS, and I'm interested in neutralization, without certain maps. My name is Jeff Schreiber. I work for the City of Chicago Department of Transportation. I um, manage uh, railroad-related and transit-related projects. And I'll use the same company I go to. I'm just here representing myself. My first time here. My name is Ryan Lakes. I'm an architectural professional. My name is Renee Kocha. Uh, I'm maintaining high interest. I'm just going to be here. Hi, I'm a web developer. Uh, my name is Gabriel Connors. Uh, it's my first time here. I just moved to the city from Boulder, Colorado. So I'm And uh, I'm more of a sort of social civic engineer in theory, not so much practice or accreditation. And I'm interested in seeing what kind of momentum we have. Creativity can be networked around the community that just makes some awesomeness happen. You know there's no skiing here, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Tom Lady, I'm a sociology. I'm 
to Chicago and the past few years. Yeah, I wouldn't see this game anyway. Um, that's everybody. Yeah, that's good. Actually, before we d dive in, do we have any announcements or comments about the human condition? Yeah. Eric, right now? No. Okay. Joel. What is justice? <laughs> oh, wait, yeah. Uh, Joel Olson, finalist. You, you guys are semi finalists for the Night News Challenge, so. Yeah. And what, yeah. what do you do? What are you doing? Uh, yeah. what is it? Our proposal was to try to build an interface between Twitter and the city's open 311 system. Our theory is people complain on Twitter about what's going on in the city. If we can intelligently pick tweets about specific sp specific items in the city and route them via the 311 system to the correct department, that would be getting something for nothing. Exactly. Food poisoning. So if somebody uh, maybe complain on Twitter they got food poisoning, and we can intelligently deduce that they it is truly a food poisoning case, and they were able to state some details of where they may think they had gotten it. We can put that in the Open 311 system, have that routed to the city health department, and they can send inspectors out to inspect. That sounds kind of cool. How do they do it now? <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Uh, you're supposed to, most people don't know this, but if you contact food poisoning from a restaurant, you're supposed to report it, you have a duty to report it. Uh, most people don't know that, though. Uh, so a lot of these cases do get left unreported, and you know, you have a cluster of people getting food poisoning from the same location, and the public health department wouldn't even know about it. And so now you're kind of bypassing the need for people to even call in and tell the city about it. If they shot it and out in the loud room that is Twitter, and you can pick it out with your huge your piece, <laughs> yes. then you can then tell the city about it. Yes. And you've done some tests with machine learning and all this stuff. Exactly. Uh, we have some data uh, out there. We've been collecting food poisoning tweets in the city for about a year now. And our classifier is about 85% accurate, whether or not it's a true food poisoning case or if it's just someone talking about uh, maybe food poisoning research or a new paper came out or something. So we can, we're about 80 85% accuracy of uh, determining the patterns and the language, whether or not it's somebody talking about a, a honestly got food, food poisoning case. Cool. Any other announcements? All right, well then, without further ado. Um, well, thanks everybody. Uh, this, this is my first open hack night, and this is my, probably my closest proximity to, to this many tech people, so uh, just go easy on me a little bit. Uh, I want to thank Stephen and, and Juan Pablo for uh, inviting me uh, tonight. Uh, sorry, this can be uh, on official terms. So uh, my my discussion is going to be more on the link between transit and uh, economic development here. And so I think there's a lot of interesting things. But that's also my perspective as a, as an urban planner, as a practitioner for the last ten years. Um, also, my just my general interest uh, you know, in urban planning are those things in between mobility and and things like the health of the city or health of the neighborhood. Just to put in the very broad and check terms. So uh, I'm going to share a couple of things that are out there and then also pose a couple of questions. Um, let's start from the standpoint of, of uh, you know, why do we need a better connected city or why is it important? And for there's two there's two separate uh, schools of thought here generally that, that one it's important for connectivity to jobs in the central area. And, the second part of that, and these are not competing at all, uh, is that you know these neighborhoods that have uh, high connectivity, whether that's transit or highway or bike walkability, uh, also have this livability. There's, there's a lifestyle choice in people who live in those neighborhoods. And to observe planners, this is this is theory that we study, and these are things that, that are apparent to us. But I just want to make sure we're all grounded uh, here on the same. Um, and so, you know, within looking at that, you know, those are things I think in the, the, the professional discussions are, are apparent, but not so much as, as, as actually linking value in the city and that, or value of transit to to the health of those neighborhoods. Um, I think they're implicit, uh, but, but, you know, one thing that, that interests me are our studies and tools that, especially with data now that, that there's a, a GTFS speed for all the, the CTA for the bus routes and the train routes. And uh, 
and then we also have data on permits and data on rents now. And those things are becoming much more and more apparent. I think we kind of scratched the surface on a couple of studies and, and some things that we have time to have interns look into or students look into. But I think it's something that's that's really neat that there's there's a there's a there's a space to explore. So I'll go into a little bit of that now. Um, there's been a few studies kind of on the macro level showing the um, uh, showing the relationship of transit uh, areas that are well served by transit and values. This one was just released a couple of weeks ago, and I think we covered by Steven. Uh, uh, I'm just going to do it. it. <laughs> Everyone else already covered it. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is by, by values, you mean home values? Home values, yeah, exactly. So this, 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 this uh, graph on the bottom shows that uh, those areas that are within the transit shed or within walking distance, a half mile, fare much better. Those values either maintained or grew. And season in cities across the country uh, and so so this is recession numbers this is uh, comparing 2006 to 2011 uh, so in Chicago for instance those those areas that are within half mile of the CTA or, or metro station in the six county regions so this includes suburbs uh, those those areas those home values performed about 30 percent better than, than those that were not around transit stations so this is this is just one fact. Um, uh, this this next uh, this next thing I like. You know how many of you've seen this tool? But this is this is really cool. Uh, I feel like this is the way that we actually uh, view the geography. So this is Matt Lipson. This this links to uh, transit data for travel times, and so what this does is. We can we can set our, our, our marker here at the center of the city. Of, uh, I think that's at Madison Estate, which is the center of the city. And this looks at CTA, Metro, uh, base uh, uh, transit options, and actually expands the city based on that. So this is at 15 minutes when you get to that, and you expand it. So this is how you get to 28 minutes. This as you can see along the, the, the rail lines here. Um, zoom out. Um, sorry. You need to put the marker back. It's going to take you to the screen. Yeah. Um, somebody can help me out, right? <laughs> yeah. Refresh it. Free to come in here. I, if you can refresh the page and then drop that. See what's going to drop me on the map. Drop that guy down. That works. <laughs> This is probably the most annoying thing for all the guys to watch. Pumping the computer. Is this Internet Explorer right there? Yeah, it sounds it looks like it might be a browser issue with this implementation. There you go. Okay. Well, this is a little too much. There you go. Here we go. All right, perfect. So you can see here, you can follow the CTA lines out. You can follow some metro lines, too, as you look at like, the dot in Schaumburg, obviously, has an express train out there from metro to the Portland Park and Tilly Park, obviously, has an express train out there, too. So what this looks like, it, you know, when you, when you look at the areas that are, that, that are that really valued in Chicago, a lot of them are linked to, to this network here. So you see Lakefront, you've got old vast service along the red line or along the express buses. As you go west, you look at that uh, Eisenhower corridor, which includes both the green line and, and the blue line. Uh, so this is a, just a really neat way that somebody else decided to, to view the city using using current data. So so this is the transit part of it, right? That that our that our city itself is not geometrically linked uh, or you know places that have better travel time. Uh, 
uh, directly. It really depends on the type of transit services in the area. Uh, what are we? So what are we looking at here exactly? Like so what is the white part? These are these are areas that all all within thirty seven minutes to uh, State and Madison. So it's almost like you're visualizing your your freedom or your your kind of freedom to get about your mobility. Exactly. From to, this point, to the this central is, area. To the central, central area. Because that's the important thing. To from the central area to. to yeah. And this is including uh, both transit and walking, right? Right. And then that's it. This is the calculation they do. So. Right. And then. You know, you can you can do this. So so the inverse is like, how great is it to live in Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> so it's all right. Oh, there it sucks. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> if you use Google's transit, and walking is actually faster. It will let you walk. Okay. Uh, okay. Is this using the Google's transit I'm API or? Yeah, so that's probably is walking. Okay. So it's probably doing something a little more complicated than that. Like, well, yeah. An origin destination. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Let's, do, let's do this. Yeah, this is this is my neighborhood here, uh, and you can see there's links, you know, within 37 minutes to the north side. You follow up a bus or two. A lot of those are local buses, right? The connection to those are local buses. You can see the blue line coming up to here, right? Well, yeah. there's 37 minutes of blue line by transfer to the bus. You should see a green line or a blue line up here. Uh, here I'm, I'm within walking distance. I'm also Metro station, so it might have some of these numbers that uh, make sense out there. The other metro line would go up here, it's stronger, so that's also a realm of possibilities for me. And so it, this is a really great tool, and it, you know, you can, you can see how, um, how the, the, the neighborhoods are, you know, let's, let's go through, I think that's a, probably a, a well served area. And let's, let's just compare it with, like, uh, I'm not picking any suburbs, but <laughs> let's just do that. You can see. Within 37 minutes, your options are locked in, and that's just a metric tree. Does this assume like current time of day or day of week? Or I, I don't know if it gets that deep, actually. Well, I guess it's, it's you know, like if you left now, there happened to be a train you got on, this is where you could go in 37 minutes. I was a little bit busier than I wanted to be. If you go to settings, it's going to tell you. Yeah. That makes sense if it's going outbound, there's probably a train coming. There's nothing going inbound, otherwise, it would be box in. Oh, it yeah. says experiment. Oh, it says experimental. Yeah, so if you throw it to Saturday, it's gonna. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So if you go to settings, I think what it does, it says, it, I think it's next time. To, I think it's like assuming you left right now, and yeah. you mostly want, yeah. you were only wanting to walk 15 minutes to a station. Um, that's what it's doing. But apparently, you can also set the time of day manually. Right? It's, it's probably gonna go back to the central area. Whoa! Oh, look at that. The world's your oyster. We'll just imagine that that one. And bike sharing is here. The transit shed will increase by the number of bike sharing stations right. that there are. Yeah, that's why we're always. So this is what people talk about: the value bike share being kind of solving the last mile from the, the rapid transit system of the L and even some of the express buses, or even the buses. Right, Choose so the kind of <coughs> the walk from the bus to your house or, or whatever it might be that last mile. Mm -hmm. Is there any other neighborhoods you want to look at? Well, when you were at your neighborhood, there was something interesting. Blue Island was still um, in the 37 minute zone, Probably good time but time. not Hyde Park. And, and I know that Blue Island has really frequent access via the Rock Island and the Metro Library. And the 60. The 60 goes to Blue Island 26 uh, in Cicero, and not the suburb. Okay. Um, has that changed recently, or has that been has that route been there? Oh, that's now? always been like that. Okay. But I'm saying uh, the, the electric has high frequency at Hyde Park, and then it splits up into three branches. Two of them terminate in Blue Island, and then a third line, the Rock Island, also terminates in Blue Island. So I understand why Blue Island has is in the zone, but not Hyde Park. Because Hyde Park during some times of the day has like every four minutes of the train. Because you catch the Rock Island line from the 
the South Street station, but you catch the Metro Electric from Millennium Station. Oh, yeah. That's the ground way down. We had more than 15 minutes of a walk. We heard seven minutes of I can't get that. So this shows us kind of how connected different parts of town are to, to other parts of town. And that's this idea of accessibility. Um, and then you were kind of going, you started to, to talk about uh, home values, right? Uh, yeah, so, so another thing we looked at too, and this was, uh, yeah. One idea we had when we were looking at a couple of our projects uh, that I'm talking about work uh, was looking at, you know, is there any link to uh, home values, right, and, and transit? And we felt like the, the for sale market was, was like a little bit too much because there's too many different externalities that can, uh, exist with, with, with the for sale. So we looked at, you know, there's a lot of apartment buildings that are pretty much standard Chicago style apartment buildings, right? Uh, you've been in one, three flat apartment, half of them, right? And one uh, concrete tower, you probably been half of that. And so, what, what maybe we're trying to look at here is this is a this is a search. We just replicated the search, uh, looking at um, the these are all <coughs> 600 and 800 square feet on Zillow, right? And then, uh, there's there are apartments between 600 and 800 square feet. We started following the city mark, right? Uh, we looked at. It. I think there, there's a couple interesting things we you know, saw. And you can see from here too. You know, we're in downtown. We're looking at you know, two thousand, two point three thousand per month, right? Two thousand three hundred. If you get further north here, you're starting to see those those decline a little bit. Um, I think one interesting thing here, though, is uh, trying to trying to put some kind of value between light areas, right? So, so one thing I was looking at was, you know, I was interested in was, was the Paul area, right? And you're trying to trying to um, isolate all the externalities here. So you're saying the Paul area, you know, is, is by the lake, right? You have know, good lake access you have. Um, you know, when there's park in the lake and you have a, a university, a major university, right? Uh, and if you compare that to another area that, that has those same characteristics being by Loyola, right? uh, where you say, you know, everything the same, Loyola has very similar characteristics, but the only difference between Loyola and, and, uh, and, and, um, and the Paul area is, you know, basically the travel type of activity to downtown and the rest of the region, right? Paul's a bit more central. Uh, travel time to downtown is uh, 20 minutes and a long on the bus. Uh, Loyola is, 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 is a little bit longer, but not that much, you know, so it, it raised an interesting question. So, uh, this you can see here around Loyola, you're looking at you know fifteen hundred dollars for the most expensive apartment, and a lot of those are below a thousand. You can see that on this, this data. You go back down again towards the hall, and you're seeing a premium for that. Not to say that's the only thing, but for that access, where everything is at least a thousand dollars. You're seeing uh, you know, much higher. Uh, or on those prices. So, um, I don't want to open up for any thoughts or questions on this. I think it's just fascinating. Are you guys trying to prove that the, the walkability to the CPA station increases property value? No, I guess what I'm trying to, and, and it's not me, it's, it's my own personal interest in it, uh, is, is, you know, is there a value of being better connected or better connected to downtown? Is, is there a level that, uh, where, there's a level that, there's a level off of that 25 minute travel time, right? And I'm looking at an apartment in the city or in the city that I, I want to get to work in under half hour, right? And that's enough of a driver to influence values. Uh, I was thinking about this a while ago um, when the CTA was having trouble getting funding for the water racing areas that happens every couple of years old or whatever. I was trying to, to justify it in my head. That, CTA uh, stations, the L train stations, definitely increase property value in the city five. I've even heard recent discussions about well, does that justify increasing, allowing an increase in the, uh, the height of buildings that can be built? Because each, each uh, plot has the maximum height that the building can be built. But I was like, does the CTA get that uh, property tax money? So 
going to get back to it in, in some form. Those are the increase in property value that would be the, 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 the scheme of the life. Does that come back to the CPA? Definitely. I'm not going to get into funding issues. <laughs> it's just, I'm not going to do it, so I'm sorry. I, I'm very interested. It's actually a pretty easy answer. Uh, but I'm, but I'm not, not going to necessarily. I just want to go down the road. But, but the rest of us can. So, so it, isn't it all just only sales tax funding? That there's also real estate transfer tax. There's every time that you sell a property somewhere. Right. So the transfer would help the CTA a little bit. It's really low, but it's brand new tax, I believe, from 2009. But there's this thing called value capture, which is exactly what I was talking about. How do you capture the value that the CTA or any transit agency provides? Okay. And we don't really do that in Chicago. And we're getting at the idea that, okay, so it's valuable to be able to be connected to the rest of the city, which is what we saw early on. So that might or might not seem there's decent evidence that it's reflected in increased home value at the very least. Right, and we don't have like comprehensive zoning plans, as I'm sure you guys figured out, or you second city zoning, like it's pretty haphazard. Right. And then the guy from DC, Andrew, yeah. Yeah. did that map, and you're like, oh, these don't match. Right. There's low density right next to a train station. Well, what his map showed was that there, all the density was downtown and nowhere else. Right. Right. So, um, so, so if there's one issue which is zoning, would it make sense that more people would be <laughs> able to benefit from this thing? Also, well, another issue which is funding. If this does in fact create, if if the presence of transit creates more economic value, maybe we can capture some of that value to, to expand and maintain. Right. So things like a TIF district would replace T with transit. No, that makes it sound much better. So, <laughs> <laughs> maybe so a better act Current answer, as I understand, is no. Correct. For do we have value capture? Or do we have value? But it's being documented. Part of the problem is that they've said that name with some good reason. Oh, well, I don't mean to take a tip and turn it into it. I mean, take a, make a transit improvement district. Tip. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, very simple. So as we do now, it just yeah. doesn't necessarily go to trend. That's true. And the, so the theory of it is you're doing this somewhat something similar, except you're doing it for kind of the local economy or the building. You're saying this place is blighted, it's going to stay blighted unless we invest in it, but we don't have money to invest in it, so let's borrow money, invest in it. That'll spark catalyzed development. We'll have more property values and we'll pay back the loan. So if you're kind of in theory, you are borrowing, you're kind of unlocking value, right? Uh, that you would never otherwise have. The problem is that there's tips all over the map, and the accounting for how they work is, has been very shoddy historically. So we just don't know if they're doing a good job. And what we do know is they're being spent for all kinds of stuff, some good, some bad. It's really all over the map. And so the question is could you do a more targeted thing? Since we are pretty broke, especially transit, we think transit is valuable because it gives you freedom. Is there a way to actually have to find new local sources of money for transit? That's kind of that doesn't suffer from the problems of this. In any uh, transit history books in your answer, when we were first building out transit in Chicago, wasn't that a value capture of public private partnership before we even strictly five? Yeah. yeah. The Alley Elevator oh. Company. And we didn't have ours, you know, that compounding factor, but it was the businesses built it up because I knew this is what we get clients to our businesses. They, they were done as profit making. Ventures in itself, but the assumption was that I mean, if this is true of a lot of things, technically, transportation, you know, the parkways, for example, were built to, to drive development. You know, <coughs> the reason, you know, Samuel Insall, who was the founder of what came uh, Commonwealth Edison, the electric company, bought the, the rapid transit company because they were the major purchasers of electricity. I mean, it was all a way to make money. So, yeah, I mean, yes, it's brought into the question. A lot of the original railroads were financed by issuing stock that to raise money. Money was built in the railroads, and the railroad went bust, and the shareholders lost their shirts too. So. so it actually kind of seems to me like people that either this wasn't true, or people didn't understand that this was true. It's a little bit strange. For example, high parking, wood lawn, and down seats, and so on. There's also a theory too that the uh, safe street mall killed the retail and the retail wasn't dying because suburban shopping was just trending that direction. So I'm wondering if that isn't your first study actually shows that the value of transit is It's 
you know, nothing happened between 2006 and 2006. Yeah, all those. And then, you know, and then there's other trends too. Uh, <laughs> they're driving, driving much less, right? Car, car companies can't figure out how to market to them. Uh, they're driving less. They're, purchase, they're not purchasing cars until they're much, much older. Uh, so it's, it's more of a demographic change on that end too. I think that's feeding into this. So you're seeing that. And I think the other interesting thing is cities all over the country, even cities that are shrinking overall, like Detroit and Cleveland. Right. We're seeing a growth in their central area where there, you know, there are the mobility factors there. Yeah, of course, it's all really hard to set it up in transit specific effects. I think <laughs> agree, but, but I think it, it gets to that where, where transit actually provides a mobility advantage to a neighborhood. So, so that was kind of another point, a side point. If you live in a, uh, say you live in my neighborhood in West Ham, right, uh, and there's a lot of people who live in my neighborhood that do reverse commute, but they choose to live in my neighborhood because they walk to the coffee shop to the grocery store, and they look at the good for mobility factors, right? And uh, there's, there's you know, more, more places to go. And it, it's, a, it's a reason why I moved here from Cleveland. Like, it's the same, same thing. It's like I didn't, I didn't move here because it, it, we had a, a good transit system. I didn't say I'm choosing Chicago over other cities. I said I moved here because. Right. You know, you look at that, it gets down to that theory. So that's a, that's the mobility right? the mobility factor that you're seeing that those trends nationwide. I think you're the loose trend. We have a true believer. <laughs> <laughs> what about the uh, south side? For because it's kind of more high end, but what about some of the working class and some of the poor neighborhoods, uh, even as far as I'm good? Or will this map show, or will put it back to show to people that sure. are along the line? Or, you know, I didn't, didn't go that far in, in looking at this. I was, what I was trying to do is really isolate to like neighborhoods, mm -hmm. that the only difference was like, the travel time to that town. And so I think it would be a, an interesting next step. But again, I was trying to isolate all the externalities and understanding that they were two um, upper middle class neighborhoods. Right there. Uh, so uh, I think that there would be a next step is if you can try to isolate. You see a lot more home values, which would indicate that transit is not the only thing that's going on. Right? There's also history as the fact that neighborhoods have declined overall and then some have come back and some, uh, for a lot of historical reasons, um, are not there. So, well, allow me to contribute to this one, please. please. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, your first question was uh, about the difference between uh, the Yola in a similar area to something that is closer downtown, yet everything seems to get towards the center. Well, I'm just going to put a hypothesis out there from the experience I had of uh, I'm getting off the train. I live the south side now. I used to live in the Yola. Uh, but um, talking to a worker, just making sure that he actually works somewhere in the line. Yeah, yeah, and so so he works in Skokie, but I'm so I'm chitting chatting with him at the Orange Line at Western. So I'm thinking, you know, all right, people are not driving to work, but people, lower level workers who are working in the case of Loyola do have a high property value, um, almost barrier as to how closely he gets to their work. So maybe that's why you add all this value to the very central loop that we have it's because it does connect everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, without getting into politics, I do put some value at the lower level workers who make the thing kind of. Um, well, we, you know, I think he was a, I think he was a janitor, and, and I'm using that hypothesis just to you know put out there for any other level worker. Gets things done. But yeah, road transportation, I would see that as being one of the differences in between uh, DePaul and uh, Riola, where like, you either have to either move close or have access to transportation. And if you're moving close, you're going to have to be in a high property value uh, area for Riola. And, and part of the other issue I did that too is a lot more apartments. You can see that it's kind of a 
data was much more rich. So, so that I was just a good side. This is like really soft. So, since we have another speaker, why don't we uh, let him speak and then we can continue the discussion and talk to the break. Uh, if people want to get to that work, can get to work and then we can keep talking for everybody. Sound good? How do you want to keep us talking about it? Thanks. I need to go down there and get for dinner. Uh, do you want to? Yeah. The, I can yeah. just grab the cord and just yeah. should be. Give out VGA out on your laptop. I do. Okay. Did you look at when Watt Square was introduced? Was that having the kind of tip of three out? Well, it's only going to go this far. Yeah, it'll work. Fog needs to be in trying to do a transit score also. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just an interesting way to, you know, use the data to score. Again, it really gets to not only have sound at all, but it also includes like those. You can give me a big no. Uh, yeah, we did find it. Right? Yeah, you get the look. It's just an example. 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 It's just an do you, have, do you have some way to like detect the displays, or is it usually just work when you plug something? It usually just works. The other, uh, I guess, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing anything here. Might be in the settings, the display options. I can do a vote. Oh, there we go. Just had to, just had to wiggle the cord. <laughs> Magic on yeah. Yeah. There's a question. How many? How many actors did it take? Function chief. You know. Uh, are you ready? All set. Okay. Uh, maybe introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Ed Zadi. Hey guys, we're going on to the next presentation. My name is Ed Zadi. Uh, do a lot of writing and also have lately become a transit planner. Although I have done it consulting for many years, but this is a something we came up with in consultation with a number of CTA alumni, some of them are here today, uh, to because there is this the CTA has not done a great deal more development with respect to the planning department. I'm not representing anybody. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of I can possibly take. <laughs> Mostly to funding cutbacks, in all seriousness, there has not been a lot of long term planning at the CTA, and we thought, you know, that it is high time. So, I won't, without a whole lot more preamble, I will go into this. I will emphasize here that this has a lot of data in here, and it's also got some plans, but the plans are all conceptual. They, with a lot of detailed analysis, we need to have. So none of that has happened. However, the, 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 the data underlying this. A lot of thought has gone into it, but I want to concentrate mostly on that. I want to start with the demographic. This is the really big picture here. This is what we, we are dealing with in Chicago with what some have called demographic inversion. In the 20th century, the inner city was poor, and the outer suburbs, or the outer parts of the city were the affluent parts. The, the red here corresponds to, this, these are the census caps, these little squares. The red, and the darker the red, the lower the median income in that track is below the median for Cook County as a whole. Blue is above, and the darker the blue, the higher it is above the median for Cook County as a whole. So as you can see, the inner city here, this is back in 1980, was impoverished, and the affluent neighborhoods such as they were at the time were mostly on the periphery here, and for 
Southwest, perhaps not even relative. 31 years later, the situation has substantially reversed. That's the inversion. The, by far the most prosperous part of the whole town is the core, which is the north side up to an extent, but also pretty far south, down the Cermak Road. And not all the peripheral neighborhoods have had problems, but some of them certainly have. You look at Roseland area, a lot of the far south side has not kept up. Likewise, parts of the southwest side and parts of the west side, Austin, for example, have deeper poverty than they did 30 years ago. So you know that we lost 200,000 people. Chicago lost 200,000 people, huge loss uh, over the last you know, 2000 to 2010 census. However, households, as distinct from individuals, are up in most of the core. Now this compares, this shows the percentage change of population, that is counts of individuals. And as you can see, there were losses all over the place, including a lot on the north side, surprisingly, because it seems like it's a prosperous part of town. However, if you look at the same percentages, but of households, and remember, households are the more important economic unit. That's who buys the durables, that's who buys apartments, buys houses, and cars, and all that kind of stuff. In many, in some parts of the town, the number of the population has gone down, but the number of households has gone up. That's a classic sign of gentrification. You have mm -hmm. small affluent families replacing larger working class. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, this is very true, very heavily the case in West Town. Also the West Side. Interesting, Midwest Side, yeah. Now there are some parts of town, there's no question about it. They have lost people and households. But the poor, for the most part, and this goes pretty far south, down to what I, you know, the greater Brownsville area, you might call it down, have gained both people and households. So the poor itself is doing pretty well. Now, we get into what I would have to call a paradox here, because we've lost 200,000 people, and in fact, the city's now at the lowest population since World War I, on a 2.6 million. But L ridership is at the highest level in at least 50 years, and probably longer. They only have comparable numbers back to 1960, but we are now, this is the number of people who go to the turnstile, 190 million in 2012, which is the highest by far, <laughs> surpassed the 1967 total, and probably as far back as the 1940s. If you look at just the last 20 years, what has really dropped is bus from almost 650 million at one point to 300,000 now. So that's dropped. It's, sort of steadied and been climbing a bit since the mid-90s, but rail has been rising much faster. This shows the daily entering passengers, and that, as one would suspect, also is at the highest level this past year in the, in the history of modern counting methods. We had different methodologies back in the day. Now, a more interesting figure, I think, and this shows you the value of open data, because I got this from the C's data portal that the city, the CTA has a subset of, this shows 3,000 data points from 2001, beginning of 2001 to the end of 2012, filtered for weekdays only. And this shows rail ridership on each of those 3,000 days, and this includes unlinked, including the turnstile count plus cross platform train. Now what's interesting, now the low points here typically are the days between Christmas and New Year's, when even though they're officially birthday, those are low. What's more interesting, though, are the peaks. You'll notice even back to, you know, 12 years ago, there were peaks every so often, and above 800,000. And as you might guess, if you thought about it for a while, those are mostly associated with special events. Probably, if I give you 10 seconds, you think what special events I'm talking about, mostly July 3rd fireworks, which when they had it was, essentially a third rush hour on a work day, remember, and the system was completely packed when that closed for hours. And so that's, for there, 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 if it didn't get to 800,000, it got pretty close. So it did. Now, we were, 800,000 is a somewhat arbitrary measure, but I think it's fair to say when you're above 800,000, with given that the system uh, you figure the way it is, you're at crush load. Crush load being defined as you cannot get any more people on the train and people are left on the platform. 
Thank you for coming on this. It was, it's a somewhat random number, Jeff and I had a discussion this morning about it, but it's, it's, good, it's, a, it's a rough measure of the crowdedness of the system. Now, clearly there are parts of it that are more crowded than others. The south side has much more capacity than the north side does. However, as a rough measure for purposes of this discussion, I think it will do. Interestingly, between the beginning of 2001 and the end of 2011, there were five, one, two, three, four, five times when the number of riders on the system per day was above 800,000. In 2012 alone, there were 16 times. I want to show you the graph of most of those times. The first two times were special events. The first day of Lollapalooza and the third day of Lollapalooza. The third time was September 20th, an ordinary work day. And in fact, between about, uh, this is the, this shows the ridership between the day after Labor Day and the day after the day before Thanksgiving for 2000 versus 2012. This historically is the busiest season for CTA. Mm -hmm. And between September 20th, more or less, and a month later, 26 consecutive work days, 13 of those days, the ridership was above 800,000. So it's fair to describe that as frustrating. <coughs> and having ridden the trains at that time, I can tell you it was. You could not, people were left on the platform every single time I rode. So it's fair to say we are pretty close to the carrying capacity of the system now in the fall and in the spring now and in the winter, for example, it's lower. But in the fall, we are pretty close to the carrying capacity of the system given the existing riders of path. Now, it's certainly the case that if you're on the south side or if you're on the west side, you can get on the trains up that other path. But the north side, they are definitely proud. And you can also see, you can see the pattern, you know, if Columbus Day is always lower and Veterans Day is always lower, yada, yada. But in 10 years, the number who ride per day has risen by 150,000 pretty much across the board at a steady rate. And if you just project out, the ridership is probably going to go down this year because of the fare increase and that's got construction projects and yada yada. But if one assumes that they revert to the median a couple of years out, probably in 2014, my guess is there's going to be 39 of those 52 days and it's going to be across the capacity. And as the system continues to get busier this year, it gets worse and worse. Now, why does this occur? We've got, we're losing population, but the ridership is going up. I think there's two factors. One is increasing inner city effort. This sort of gets to the point you made a little bit earlier. The colors here correspond to blue means places where the median income in that track was above the Cook County median at the whole. And the color, the yellow and red means where the median income wasn't above the median, but the home values. The home values typically are a leading indicator of rising, a neighborhood that's improving, reviving. In 1980, when this first map was done on the left here, the busiest stops were the outlying stops. 95th was the busiest stop in the entire system, 26,000 riders per day. Uh, yeah, Jeff Park, Howard Street, busiest stops in the system. 30 years later, 29 years later, the situation is substantially different. The affluent part of town now is the core, and the south side, strikingly, is less affluent, and ridership is way, way down. 90 has had the biggest loss of any stop. Half what it was. It's still a busy stop, don't get me wrong, but it's half what it was 30 years ago. Like, you know, there's been some changes. Howard Street, less than it used to be. There's some changes they did the extension to all hair, so you put it into it. But what has gone up substantially are the close-in stops, particularly on the red line, but also on the south part, you know, the north part of the red line, the Howard branch, but also places like Roosevelt, 2,500 fighters per day 30 years ago. Now it's 11,000, one of the busiest stops in the entire This shows ridership change over 20 years broken down by station. And as you can see, it's mostly in the inner, the closed-in stops on the red line, from basically from, say, Sheridan down to, interestingly, down to about 35 by the Chinatown. On the brown line, from really Belmont South down to the Loop, and also the Loop is brown. Now, orange is a new line since 1992. That's a bit of a skew. But blue line from Logan Square down to the Loop. Green and pink aren't that busy, but where they are, where they have seen growth, it's in the closest stops, 18 on the pink line, Clinton on the green line. So this is the change? This is the change. 
So the circles on the previous slide were relative. The, these, these reflect the actual ridership. This is 26,000. It's done by area. So this is the ridership at the time in 1980. So that's that, and this is now. And this is now. This is now. That's right. So that this one seems to have lost a significant amount. It's really that 95th that right? right? That one's it's big. Yes, yeah, right, right. okay, but also Howard and sure. you know, Linden. I mean, the outline stops. I haven't all lost, but they have seen the least increase. Let's put it that way. The big growth has been in the center. And if you look on the blue line, I mean, they've lost, right? I mean, the blue line is one of the busiest lines they've got, but the, the outlying stops as of 19, as of 2012, that lost ridership. Oh, hair picked up quite a bit. And that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a little anomalous. But the big growth really has been in the closing stop. Have you tried to normalize the population in the nearby yeah, we didn't. I didn't do that. No. What I what I was what I compared it to in the earlier slide showed that was again the, the relative affluence of the area all the time, and that's not the only rich people ride the trains, but we'll we'll see this more in a second. But if you are a professional, you tend to live and you want to live in the one part of town. You live in a place that typically is served well by the uh, and you work downtown, which the rail system serves, and we'll see that in a second. This is private employment downtown. There's also 100,000. There's a lot of students, obviously. There's also a lot of government workers. But this is strictly private. The total number of employees in downtown Chicago has not changed to any significant degree for 40 years. It's been about half a million. What has changed dramatically is the mix of employees. If you look here at the top, this little orange square here was manufacturing. When I was a kid, I used to be an electrician's apprentice, and I installed printing presses on Dearborn Street, and sewing machines on Dairy Deer, all of which are gone, all replaced by condos, and we've got no all or torn down completely and rebuilt by skyscrapers. What has been increasing all that time is service and fun. And that includes a whole lot of stuff. It includes everything from lawyers and health aides to people in the technology business. But it's increased steadily for 40 years at the rate of about $5,000 per year, not a ton. But extremely steady. It's interesting that fire, which stands for what is the step right here? The Nancy Trans Hasn't actually, the share hasn't been up that much. No, it hasn't. The that here is that that's what brought back the loop, but actually, it was, it was if, if, you, if I went back to like World War II, it increased a lot. Right. But then it sort of peaked in 1990. There's a lot of consolidation in the industry, a lot of the back office is automated. I mean, there's a lot of technology that has changed these things, apart from anything to do with the city. This is just jobs. This is just jobs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for example, retailing, a lot of like wholesale trade, you see like my firm rewards and all those kinds of things, yeah. a lot of that's gone away. Retailing, the merchandise market, the merchandise market. Mm -hmm. retail trade, for example, has gone down, even though retailing in the central area has increased a lot on the street level. But if you think about State Street, Marshall Fields, we all places that are gone, that didn't even hurt any place anymore. Right. There's a whole bunch of department stores that are multi-story, hundreds of people that are all gone. All right, so this takes a look at every single year. This, that, was, that was sort of a snapshot before. This shows every year the same basic thing uh, from 1999 to date. And as you can see, there is more up and down to it than you might suggest in the previous one. But on the whole, it trends up in services even during 2008, the worst recession in 80 years. Think about that. We dropped a little bit down to 2010, and then it rebounded, and now it's at the highest level in the history of the city. After the worst recession in 80 years, this is the most dependable to job generator we have. Probably the most dependable job generator any city has. What I tried to do was to correlate anything on this with anything in terms of the transit trends. And I played around with a bunch of stuff. Interestingly, the blue lines on the top there, the heavy line is central area service sector jobs, okay? The lighter blue line is rail ridership. And as you can see, they tend to trend up together. And where they don't, it can mostly be explained, in my opinion, by circumstance. In 2007, or 2007, they began the tree tracking project to expand the brown line from six cars to eight cars. And they Oh, it's a track, and I took a bunch of trains off, and all that stuff. It was really hard to get on. So, not surprisingly, during that time, rail ridership dropped substantially. Bus ridership went up. They finished that 
I think at the end of 2008, it took a while for everything to get back in order, but eventually everybody migrated back to the rail system, and now they have gone up in lockstep for the last three years. So these rail tracks extremely closely with, uh, with service sector employment. Interestingly, bus tracks with total employment. It's been pretty flat, and bus has been up and down, more, not a completely in lot, but, but tracks pretty closely with total employment, and that's about what it was 20 years ago. So more of the jobs have triggered the service jobs, and as you've seen that, more people are writing in. That's right. Suggesting yes. that service workers take, take, they take the L. And take the L more than other people. Right. The hypothesis here, and I have to call it hypothesis because it's kind of hard to believe, and I want to get some corroborating data here. The hypothesis is that every new employee in the service sector, which is a pretty broad sector, obviously, takes the L preferentially to every other method of training, which is a sharp change from the historical period. It could also be that everyone else changed their mind as well. They could. I mean, there's a lot of things that are kind of hidden in the service, and really hard to break it out. But the, if you... Um, I thought now we're going to look. But it'll come back to me. Um, the, the hypothesis here, though, is if you compare it to the historical pattern, the, the census does a thing every 10 years. And in 2000, 20% of people who work in the central, the, the core of the city, broadly defined, which is basically from North Avenue to Stevenson, from Ashland to the Lake, 20% take the Take the L, 20% take Metro, 15% take the bus, 40% drive, and 5% from the slab. They're going to publish in May of this year the, oh. the latest version of that. It'll be interesting to see, and it will corroborate the thesis here, that new workers primarily use the CTA rail system. And that's got a big impact because if it increases the multiplier, every new worker, now, if every single new worker is taking the L, it's going to increase the burden on the rail system. Tremendously more than the deputy case in the past. Why is that around the only one that's in there? Do you not have data before that? That's all data I had handy. I mean, if you could, when, you know, at some point we're going to have to go back farther and see how. Now, at some point the pattern's going to have to go apart. This wasn't the case 40 years ago, been, but at least as far back as 1999, we're very close to all So, now we're trying to project. Now, there is, it seemed to me that if you could, if in fact, the service sector employment was a, was a close predictor of growth. You take it 10 years, 10 years out and see what happens. So I did a little algorithm here. And this is a relatively modest increase in employment in the service sector, just 5,000 years. It's a historical pattern for four years. Okay? Pretty conservative. Not a gigantic change. However, the, that translates into an increase of almost 110,000 riders per workday. It's primarily because they everybody you do the math and everybody takes a trip there and they take a trip back and you assume a couple of transfers and this and the other thing. That's what it works out to be. Now that is a hypothesis, and you know maybe it won't work out that way. But if you do the most brain dead thing I could think of, which is just to do a straight line extrapolation of the change from 1992 to 2012, you get almost the same result: 847,000. So I think it's pretty safe to say this is the conservative assumption. Now some people will say, well, you can't assume things are going to go up indefinitely. True enough. And I used to make the caveat when I did things like this, you know, barring economic catastrophe. However, I don't make it anymore because we had an economic catastrophe and it made no difference. So we're going to have a big, big change. We have more than this because if there's a tech in because I got this from up in Chicago. And these are all the tech firms in downtown Chicago. And as they note on the website, 71 of the top 100 are a mile from this building. Now, the thing that's unique about the situation we have now is that the north side and the core, the downtown part, have borne the brunt of the front. This is Belmont, spring a couple of years ago. The big numbers all come in from O'Hare on the blue line, on the, on the elevated, brown, brown line and purple line, purple express, and on the red line. We have a lot more capacity on the south and the west side. The, oh, the trains are cross a lot of times and now account for 58%. These three, these three corridors here account for 58% of the non-loop ridership versus just 42% of 
1976. Interestingly, they went ahead, they realized they had a problem, you know, 15 years ago, and increased the capacity on the brown line from six cars to eight cars. So the 33% increase, obviously. At the time, there were 80,000 riders a day carried on the brown line. Now, there are 105,000, a 31% increase. So all of the capacity, almost, got taken up within just three years. Now, they got a little bit of room, there's no question about it, but the way things are going, it's all going to be taken up in a couple of years. What makes life even more complicated is that these, this is a rail system. You have to operate it as a system. You can't do it in piecemeal fashion. The red line runs from Howard Street down to 95th. Most of the ridership, 125,000 riders a day in London, boards north of the Grand Avenue to Howard from, uh, from Surmat down to 95th, only 51,000. So they have, they have to run a lot of trains to carry all these people, and then they're pretty much empty. Outbound, obviously, but also inbound, they, they do things like they run the trains at three minute intervals south and six minute intervals north, and that helps a little bit, but it's a very clumsy way to operate. So they do run shorter route, routes, though, like on the blue line, they run just from Jefferson Park down. You're right. Yeah, you're way ahead of yes, okay. this, is, this is something they can do on some routes, but not all of them, and not on web. And that's a real problem. This just shows you the number of trains they're going to need. It's 720. Um, would you like to give this in a row? So we could just kind of go through the next few. I'll blast through it. This shows you some of the limitations on the blue line. You can't short term trains, is what they call. Mm -hmm. it comes down here, goes to UIC, backs up, goes to Jeff Park, backs down again. So you can double up the surface on the blue line. It's a very convenient way to do that. Not so easy on the brown line. They basically, because Kindle Yard is full, they run trains out of Midway. Turn into brown lines when they get to the loop, they go all the way back up to Kimball as brown trains and then come way back down. It would be better if you could short turn the trains here, because going from here to here is kind of a waste of time and not much traffic. They can't do that, but it works. You know, it's okay. Red has the busiest line that has the least flexibility. In 1949, there used to be a terminal at Wilson, and there used to be a branch line in the 40s on the Kenwood branch, and they could do locals between these two points. You could Increase oh. the service close in. Inner city was depopulating. They tore these things down, took the service out, and now there is no place on the north side to turn trains around. And the only places on the south side are at 63rd and the 137th, which worked very well because of it. So they have the least flexibility. Basically, their only choice here is going to turn all the way from one end to the other. Which means that so you need to run a bunch of trains to make sure you have the right level of service up north, and you're going to have a bunch of empty trains. You've got a lot of empty trains down south. Empty -ish Except the blue, <laughs> the blue and the brown, I've both been, I've been on both of them, and I ran them on the other track. On the other track. Of the blue line? It's the blue and the brown. The blue? We'll be going in on the blue, we're going in, and they say, okay, we're going to quit running in, and we're going to turn this thing around, and we're going the other way. On the blue? On the blue. I, I, and the on the U, there's a short turn at UIC. Is that what you do? They get the no, UIC? No, out north. I'm not sure what you're talking about. There was an emergency situation that's maybe a little different. Well, construction. Okay, construction is kind of, this, this is routine operation I'm talking about. There may be construction situation. The other problem, and I'll go through this really quick, in addition to the, the crush capacity on the trains themselves, is there is a real shortage of developable land, developable land in the core defined as areas that you can get to conveniently by transit. Little yellow square here is where Central and West Loop, which is where 62% of the office space is. And the reason that's true is because this is the only parts of town that are walkable from Metra. Metra and the CTA do not connect. We are the only system, San Francisco building that connects. We are the only city in the country that does not have direct connections between its rail system, its near rail system, and its transit system. Because of that, because the bus system is completely clogged up. You can see down here. The only way you can, the only place where it's, you can get financing for an office building is in this little square. And as you can see, we have all kinds of empty space elsewhere in the central area that we can't get to, which no other cities have. I mean, we have a thriving downtown that we could expand many times if you could get there, but you can't. So, talking about a new paradigm, I'll go through this really quick. This is a proposal here. I emphasize again, this is a proposal. But based on existing city plan, talking about a subway line 
along Clinton Street that would connect all of the rail stations to the rapid transit system, number one, and in addition take care of the capacity situation. And I emphasize again, this is a conceptual thing. This is the existing system. This is with the additions. You can see here, this is a quote from the cranes talking about this, this central area, which has the potential of double in size, with all the length of all. And it would serve the, the fastest growing part of the core. And in addition, would take care of the crowding issues, because I think the first phase, now the city's made, the CTA made it pretty clear. We met with the CTA a couple of times. The thing they want to do next, after they get done with the state of the repair problems, which is just the slow down and all that kind of stuff, is an extension to 130. The mayor has made a commitment, it's going to happen, okay, fine. But at the same time, we are arguing here, you need to be able to take care of the core capacity issues by building layup tracks at Belmont and also at Summit. So you could short-term trains, as is now done on the blue line, you could, I'll show you how this works, you could have trains start at Howard, go to Summit, short-term to Belmont, short-term again, go back down to 130, and do the same thing from 130. 30th, Belmont, Summit, that's the house. You increase the, you would serve 130th well. At the same time, you would increase the capacity even more by more than 40 percent. Or alternatively, there are many ways to do this. You could run the Purple Line Express into the subway, turn it around at Summit, and meanwhile, run these short, these orange, remember, the, the CTA now runs five orange line trains up to, they turn into browns and so on. Short term then at Belmont. Bring them back down. That's more efficient operation. It's a 20% over what you've got right now, with a nominal increase in number of trains. Then this is additional phases. I won't go into this in detail. This is conceptual. This would all have to be argued out. There are many ways to do this. You could do different things. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we are facing a capacity crunch on multiple levels, and we need to think about what to do. Because if we don't do anything, we're going to get two problems. We've got to do something, and the question is really good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe we can take a couple questions and then break out. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Absolutely. Three questions. Yeah. All your, your, all your suggestions here are going to cost big bucks. Is there anything they can do without building out more infrastructure? Uh, I remember they used to have uh, A trains and B trains. To do skip stops. Is that, that to me would be something they could they, they, they could do a couple of things. I will skip back here. The, the first thing, building the layup tracks here is something that could be done for the tens of millions of dollars. Right. Now this is in conjunction with this is a whole separate project, 130%. But this these improvements, which would substantially which would probably buy you 10 years right. in terms of capacity, would be in, you know, I don't know exactly, but under under hundred million dollars. It seems like a lot of bill, but as transit projects go. You know, Other things they could do, and they would have to do, are the, the, the load capacities on the cars themselves are low by national standards. The, you know, the, the IRT in New York, for example, no, gets 160 people at peak per car. On a 51 foot car, we get 90, 100, 105. There's a design they have to design cars that are well, but they, you look at the specs. There's the, 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 the design capacity of an IRT car is, is 160. The design capacity of a CTA car is 132. The New York City Transit lows to capacity. We don't get anywhere near capacity. Probably because of the seating design. Right. You could reconfigure the interior. You could get more people standing, obviously. But the cars physically are built to take more people by a long shot than they and that would be a relatively cheap thing to do. You looked at all at the uh, uh, street cars, modern street cars, not really expanding capacity. Or also bus rapid transit, right? There's bus. IRT, but street cars, uh, a lot more people ride street cars. The, there's a whole debate to be had. We went over this talk at Metropolitan Planning Council, which is yeah. pushing a BRT program. Mm -hmm. And basically, I said we are not in competition with you guys because BRT needs to happen because rail projects have such a long lead time. It'll take 10 or 15 years. BRT you can do it in a year or two. So they need to happen in parallel. In the end, I mean, the, the cost of operating a bus or a BRT vehicle that maybe take 100 people or even 
gigantic ones take 250 versus what you can get with one operator on a train where you can get now, you know, 700, 20, 800, and potentially you can get 1,200 people on a train. I mean, the, the, the operating costs for a bus are much, much higher than the operating rate. So I think in the end, the economics will drive toward rail. But they need to have them in parallel in the short term. That's the only thing they can get from that. Service rail or elevated or subway rail? Good, excellent question. The problem you get into, and there are places like in the Green Line and Boston, for example, which where they have the, the streetcar system, the Green Line, which is built in the subway. You know, going back to the old days, and also in Harvard Square, where they, where they run the buses through a tunnel. It works. You can do it that way. Building the tunnels, however, it, the cost is building the tunnel. Whether it's going to be a, you know, a rubber tired vehicle through there or a rail, a steel tired vehicle, is not the big driver of the cost. It's getting it grade separated. Once you account for the grade separation, it's really you know, it's a question. You know, there, is a, there is a cost jacket, but it's not huge. But getting it to off the surface, and surface is what slows down buses, it's what slows down street cars. That's what killed them in the first place. Is it the surface or is it the volume of this? Well, I mean, clearly it's the competition for the fixed model service. I mean, if you can make cars go away, yeah, you can have a problem. But it can happen. If, and so the, the choice, if you can, if you could build, you know, streetcar tunnels. At one time there was a discussion in the 30s about building streetcar tunnels into the loop. The Secretary of the Interior, which was Chicago at the time, said, we're not going to do that, we're going to build a big blue line instead. And so we got it. Hey, however, it is a choice. I mean, it's an alternative that will work. You could pull the things, you could, you're not going to do it upper on bridges with buses and the bodies, but you could build towers that buses or streetcars or VIP or whatever else could run. All right, uh, so I think we're all hungry. And there's people here. So why don't we break? And then if you guys want to hang out and talk, okay. Um, usually at this point, we need to run a lot of people on the job. And uh, so who's got some questions? If anyone wants to talk about what they have, yeah. go ahead and yeah. um, Who here is here for the very first time? So every week I do a kind of a 15 minute civic hacking one on one to sort of orient people into this world. Um, if any, who, is anybody interested in doing that? Okay. I will be. When you walk out in the hall, there's like a couch behind us. I'll be there. Can you still have Steve here? Steve assemble. Do you want to work on a school or ask them about their work? We're going to be working on this, which has to do with building data. About everything on the city building. Is anyone interested in kind of saying, okay, we learned something about transit and we want to kind of get our hands dirty with some of the transit data. I can do a little bit more transit data. I think that's good enough. Yeah. That's important. Anyone 